For the Holly Sniper EFI setup, I nominate the Submarine Jeep to be our guinea pig. This has been pretty much the mascot of my YouTube channel and uh, my Jeep life in general. And right now we've got the stock Carter WFO carburetor on here. And you can see it is leaking a little bit of fuel. It's freshly back from the Rubicon Trail. And I feel like, you know what? Carburetor just isn't doing it anymore. So this is going to be her final start on a carburetor. This is a 100% cold start. Obviously the temperature is down. And this is sitting in a 65 degree building. So it should start up relatively quick, but we will see. Pull the choke out. I am not gonna miss this process at all. Choke out, choke in, pump the gas pedal, choke back out, yada yada. Even though I most definitely have not already opened this box, let's go ahead and do a little bit of an unboxing video of the Holly Sniper EFI. So when you open it up, the first thing that you're going to see is the main shebang right here, and that is the actual sniper unit. The first thing I noticed about the sniper is how compact this thing is. Pretty much everything you need uh, on the sniper sides, mostly in here. I mean, it's got the inlet and the outlet for the fuel system. It's got an inbuilt fuel pressure regulator. It's got the wiring harness built in. I mean, there's so much stuff in this little package. It's amazing. So we're going to set that off to the side for now and keep going in here. So this is the gasket that goes on the bottom of it. Some stickers, warranty information. This is the instruction manual for installing the sniper. Here's the first part of the wiring harness and what I like right off the bat is I can see there's a plug-in that goes into the sniper. There's a built-in fuse and a built-in relay up here in the corner. Another part of a wiring harness. This baggie right here is the O2 sensor setup and this is what goes on the header or right below your engine's manifold. We've got the O2 sensor and the coolant temp sensor. I believe that's a vacuum uh, fitting right there. This is probably one of the coolest pieces. You slide this little cover off and we have a computer screen. This is what's going to display all the information of the Holly Sniper. Really bringing the old willies into the 21st century here. This is used as a tuning tool for the Sniper. It also comes with a little stylus in here so you can use it to tap and add all your settings. This is exactly how everything came out of the box. I'm going to go a little bit more in depth of what we've got going on here. What I first like to talk about is the O2 bunk. This is the only thing that I see being a little problematic, especially for Willie's Jeep. Um, this thing right here, the O2 sensor. The purpose of this O2 sensor is to tell the computer inside the sniper system how much fuel and air is coming out of your exhaust because that tells the computer how to adjust your fine tuning of the file that your Jeep is running on. And to read that, this thing has to be inside the exhaust of the Jeep. Now in a normal build, what you do is you would buy a bung that uh, this threads into. So you'd have to drill a hole through the muffler, weld the bung in, and then twist the O2 sensor into it. What Holly has done is given people an option that maybe don't have access to a welder, and they've got this little system right here. This is a bung that the O2 sensor would thread into. However, instead of welding it, there are two clamps, one for each side of it right here, and then there's an exhaust gasket. I honestly am not a huge fan of this because I can see that being problematic in the future, possible leak points, I mean, all over this thing. So just keep that in mind as we go. But what I am really amazed about is they've essentially wired it for us. I mean, there's not a whole lot going on here because they've already got a relay set up and a fuse set up. The hardest part of the wiring right here, so it's already done. And they've also labeled everything for you for an easy installation. So you could see right here. So there's the majority of the harness right in this coiled up setup. We've got one perp wire over here. And then we've got this setup right here. Well, to the left, we've got the original Carter WO. This is off a flathead 
L134 engine. This is a stock Carter YF off an F134 engine. And this is obviously a Holley setup. Now what I really find interesting is just how small the Holley is compared to the original setups. These are based off the Autolite 1100, which that is a type of carburetor that people use to put the F134 engine into a flat fender Jeep. So this is theoretically a good carburetor to put on an F head into a flat fender. Now this setup is either perfect or requires a little bit of work depending which engine you have. From the bottom these carburetors all look pretty similar. Here's the gasket for the Holley, obviously fits perfectly. The problem we run into is on the L134 engine, the flat head versus the overhead valve engine. The overhead valve, that gasket fits just about perfect. The center hole is about perfect, these holes are about perfect, no worries at all. On the flat head engine, doesn't fit. That is because the flathead uses a smaller bolt pattern than the F head engines. So if I want to line up one bolt, you can see that we are off the carburetor right there. That tells us that the manifold bolt pattern will not directly bolt up to the Holley system without some work. And as for an example, this is the original gasket for a flathead engine. And if you compare the bolt pattern of that onto the YF, you can see just when I'm talking about how much smaller it is, we're basically off half a hole. It lines up on the one side, but this side we are off quite a bit. So obviously, with the sniper set up on a flat head, we're running into some issues right there. In some positive news, the intake on the Carter WO and the YF are the same diameter, and on the sniper setup, the intake is the same size as those two carburetors, so our air horn should work no problemo. If you're new to working on a flat fender Jeep, it's very simple to take off the carburetor. We need to pop the air horn off, the choke cable that goes into the dash, then get your throttle linkage rod that goes back behind the engine, pop that off right here. You need to take your fuel line off, it could be a hard line or a rubber line, mine is a rubber line. And then once all those are off, you can finally take off the carburetor with the nuts. There's one down here, one on the other side, and just be careful not to let that spring fly up at you. There she is all removed. Don't forget to tip this thing sideways and upside down to get the excess fuel out of the float bowl right there. You want to keep track of your original throttle return spring in this little plate for now. So here's what your system should look like after you remove the carburetor. Now, a lot of Jeeps have two studs sticking out of the manifold. Mine did not come with studs. I only had one sitting around, so that's why I only have one stud on this side. I actually just used a normal bolt on that side. We've got this special gasket right here uh, that goes into the intake manifold. Filming this part after I got the Jeep running and driving because this is so critically important. As you see when I'm installing the sniper, there's the base gasket for the original carburetor. And it's got this little V-shaped piece of metal in it. There's some conflicting opinions online about what the true purpose of this was really for. The thick base gasket is definitely to keep the carburetor from vapor locking. It's really thick and the stock wheelies manifolds are just pretty inefficient so it stops some heat from rising up into the carburetor. But this little V-shaped metal right here, they believe is to atomize the fuel going into the intake because obviously carburetors aren't that efficient. So maybe for some reason they thought that uh, that helps split the flow of the fuel, I don't know. But as you see in this video, I'm installing that sniper with this thing on still. You absolutely cannot do it. You'll find out later in the video that this will create the most horrible misfire if the Jeep even starts at all. So what I did is I cut this in half of the grinder and then I bent each side back and forth till they broke off and then I used a pencil grinder to just clean up the inside edges. You absolutely have to do that for bolting on the sniper. You will be sorry. And then there's our throttle linkage. Obviously the air horn. So I'm going to set that Holly set up down and right now just kind of get a feel of how things are going to work out. You know, we're actually going to pop this top piece off. It's just held on with a little screw right on the side. Once you get the screw out of this side, just take it 
and push it forward and it should pop right off. Having just the one stud on the left side right there will actually make this nice for me test fitting the sniper system because I don't have both studs interfering with my lack of correct bolt pattern. So we're going to slide that onto there and see what we like. Look how much shorter that thing is compared to stock. We have so much clearance, about three fingers worth. Now I'm already seeing an issue right here is our throttle is hitting the exhaust manifold. So that is not good. It's in the down position right now, but uh, we still need room for the linkage to get on there. So we're probably going to actually have to space the whole thing upwards just a little bit, which I can't say I'm surprised. I'm going to figure out these two problems and then cut back when I found a solution. Using the Navy Jeep here just to show you guys what the sniper would look like on an F-134 engine in a flat fender Jeep and check it out. If you look at the overall height of the Jeep, this is on factory motor mounts in a CJ3A frame with the stock body and all that good stuff. It looks like with the air horn shortened just a little bit, I think this thing will fit right underneath the hood of a flat fender. Uh, it doesn't quite go down onto the studs of the engine. I think the bolt pattern on the engine is just a little tick narrow. I wouldn't grind out the hole on this side because it's already pretty close to the side of the TBI. So what I would do is just grind out that one and then maybe get Allen head bolts to put on there. Should fit right in pretty good. This is a gasket for the sniper. It fits down just fine, but you can tell that the bolts are definitely leaning towards the center of this gasket. It's definitely going to have to get raised up in the air a little bit with the spacer because the throttle linkage is hitting the valve cover right there. And I did notice a little bit of a clearance issue on the valve cover back here where the body of the sniper is just barely touching right there. You could probably just whack this with a hammer a few times and fix that. I'm currently draining the engine coolant down to a bucket below. That way we can get our temperature sensor installed on the engine. I was looking for the perfect spot to put our little temperature sensor. So I thought to check out the back of the engine here. Now mine's got a plug so I've got that loose. I'm going to put the sensor right here. And threads in perfectly. Now if your Jeep's got a heater system in it, there's a 99% chance that you've got one heater hose connected to there and then the other one connects right about here. So what you can do is slice the heater hose and you get a piece of uh, aluminum tubing and then weld a bung that that sensor fits into or you can probably find one on Amazon. So there's plenty of solutions for that but as for an engine with no heater that back spot is perfect. And there's our coolant sensor, nicely hidden I might add. Next step is to remove this fender, that way I can kind of reach in here and figure this situation out a little bit easier on my back, and to get to the exhaust for welding on the O2. With the driver's side fender removed, we've got access to the next few components we need to work on. And first up, we need to go ahead and get rid of the OEM fuel pump on the side of the block. Now these are only held in by two bolts right underneath the fuel pump. And why are we getting rid of this fuel pump? Well, these pumps are only good for maybe two or three PSI. And the Holly system, because it's fuel injected, needs extremely high pressure. And that's not even 10% of what we need. So we're gonna yank that off and then make a block off plate for the engine. For my block up plate right here, all I did is took a scrap piece of steel, took a fuel pump gasket, set it down, traced it, drilled a couple holes, done. Now when you make your block up plate, don't use the thinnest steel that you can find, because the problem is when you go to bolt it on the engine, it can warp and cause oil leaks. So just find something with a little bit of thickness and you'll be good to go. This takes about 15 minutes to make. If you don't want to do that, you can buy one of these off eBay, Amazon, etc. Then with our block up plate, a uh, gasket, I'm going to put Permatex on it and then bolt it right up to the empty hole on the engine and we can continue on. With our fire hazard out of the way, no more fuel pump and fuel line sitting right there, we need to weld in the O2 sensor near the exhaust. Now according to Holly's manual, they want the O2 sensor between 1 to 10 inches after the collector. On a stock wheelies, we don't have headers, we just have the exhaust manifold, and our manifold collects in right about here, so Holly wants that O2 sensor to be about 
one to 10 inches away from this point. So anywhere in this region is perfectly acceptable. Now if you've got a Clifford header for a Willys Jeep, those things come all the way down and then they collect. So you'd have to be one to 10 inches after that position. Holly mentions that they want 18 inches of exhaust pipe after the sensor is installed. Luckily for us, our exhaust pipes go all the way down the back of the Jeep, no problem at all. Now positioning the O2 sensor is extremely critical. Holly wants at least 10 degrees of angle on the sensor and I'll show you why. Notice that this Holly sensor has a bunch of little ports around it and then one in the center. Our goal is to not let moisture collect into the sensor. So if you're the kind of person that mounts your sensor upside down like this, as moisture comes out of the exhaust or collects in the vehicle as it sits, that moisture is going to sit right inside the sensor, rust it out, and it's never going to read right. So what Holly wants you to do is have at least 10 degrees of angle. So let's say about there, not good. 10 degrees about like that is perfect because the moisture can drain out of the sensor. So I personally think I'm going to put my sensor right around this area and I'm going to angle it just a little bit. Now I've got exhaust wrap so I'm going to need to cut that, drill a hole through the muffler, then weld in the bung. Most of you guys probably don't have exhaust wrap so just drill a hole, weld in the bung. This is the bung for the O2 sensor. It's just a piece of steel with some threads in it and the O2 sensor threads into this. Why Holly doesn't include this with the kit is beyond me. We need to buy one of these to weld into your exhaust. There's a little bit of a lip around here that you weld right to. My O2 sensor is installed, got the bung welded in, got the exhaust wrap back on, thread this in, got it nice and tight. I also painted my fuel block off plate and we've got some huge progress on the sniper itself. Today a guy from work really spent some time and perfected the sniper system onto the flathead engine. So he used a CAD program to make the bottom flange of the original carburetor and then replicated the flange on the sniper and had a laser machine cut out two of those flanges. They're about 3 8 inch thick. That's because when we bolt them down we didn't want them to warp and cause a vacuum leak. In between those two flanges is just a piece of tubing and it extends the sniper system up in the air and actually matches the original air cleaner horn very, very well. When we're trying to decide how tall to make that tube, we obviously need enough room to nut and bolt both flanges down, but we held up the original carburetor and we pretty much matched the height of this. If anything, this is maybe a little bit shorter, maybe a quarter inch, because if you look at the original carburetor, this top lip's pretty thick, you know, you can fit a whole finger on it, whereas the sniper, a little bit shorter, but really that's the only height difference. Not only does this thing sit perfectly with the original air cleaner setup, but it works great for the throttle linkage. So we got quite a bit of new stuff going on over here. As you saw previously, the sniper had the little arm, and then it had a little fitting that came off of here. So when we tried hooking up the original Jeep linkage, there's just an arm that comes out and connects to the carburetor. And when you push the gas pedal down, it pulls the linkage back. We tried to use the original Jeep linkage, which is just a rod. And when you push the gas pedal down, the rod pulls back. So we knocked out the little fitting that Holly had in this little bracket and put the Jeep linkage right there. But the problem is the gas pedal physically would not go down. Because if you look at that arm, it's actually going downhill. So when you press the pedal, it naturally would want to pull it back downwards rather than upwards. So we're like, okay, you know, let's look at the original Mustang that this setup is built for. When you push the pedal, it's got some linkage that connects to an arm that pushes it upwards. So what we did is weld a rod that comes out of the carburetor adapter right below the sniper system. So it sticks out and then we've got kind of a hockey stick shape linkage that then connects one end to the original sniper linkage and then the other end of the hockey stick connects to a rod that goes to the Jeep linkage right here and then obviously we've got our throttle return spring right here. I've got to say the original Jeep spring a little strong for this but I might play some different springs later. At this point we've got our Coolant sensor installed, our O2 sensor installed, the holly is mounted, the throttle linkage is done, 
All the mechanical part is essentially done. Now we just need the fuel system and the wiring. As shown in the manual, there are two ways to wire up the Holly Sniper. One is with computer controlled timing and one is without computer controlled timing. For wiring without computer controlled timing, which is what I'm going to do on the submarine here, it's so, so simple. I cannot believe how simple they make it. So obviously you've got one wire that goes to your coolant sensor, easy. You can tie it up here really nice, you may run it behind the dash. Then you've got your one wire that goes to the O2 sensor, very easy. You got the wiring that goes to the dash, it's already done for you, easy. The wide connector is actually for some extra inputs and outputs that you don't need at all. So you can take that off or do whatever, don't even worry about it. So all you need to worry about is just one part of the wiring harness right here. Can't make it any easier. Now because Holly makes this extremely easy, you need to take some pretty good care in how you do this because if you think of a modern car, all the different computer systems that they have are located throughout the chassis. They're all wired a very certain way, grounded a certain way that they don't interfere with each other. I spoke to Holly on the phone and they said this unit is a little bit picky on how you wire it because it does not like interference. You don't want to run your wires alongside other wires that go to your Jeep. You know, I've got winch wires and a horn wire and all that stuff. You don't want to run them and loom them together because they might create interference and it just throws everything out of whack. They said it's crazy of how little interference can make something not work right. So we've got the main wiring harness here, which I've already kind of strung it out. So what we've got is, first you've got these two wires that are twisted together. This is for computer controlled timing. We don't need it. Forget about it. Of course, all the wires are labeled right here. But this yellow wire goes to the negative side of the coil, very easy. The pink wire goes to keyed power. So when you turn a key switch and it goes to that first position, that's when it sends power throughout your Jeep chassis. Like I've got a fuse block connected to my Jeep and all my components, you know, my horn and my coil and all that stuff all run off of that. I'm going to hook this up to my keyed power fuse block. Now there is a relay and a fuse with the harness that goes with those wires. These are essentially for the sniper and the fuel pump system. The relay is just for the fuel pump and the fuse is for the fuel pump and the sniper. So if the fuel pump goes bad, it's going to pop this fuse. If something goes wrong with the sniper internally, it's going to pop this fuse as well. And this blue wire goes to the positive side of the fuel pump. You can tell it's pretty thick. So I spoke to Holly on the phone. I said, hey, if these are both connected to the fuse, what if I put a fuse in line with this blue wire in case if the fuel pump goes bad it pops this wire but it doesn't kill the whole Holly system which your fuel pump goes bad you're not driving your Jeep anyways but it helps for diagnosis in the future and they said yeah that'd be no problem at all and not a bad idea the last two wires here on the harness are red and black which obviously power and negative these are your two main wires that power the entire sniper system now those wires need to go directly to the battery. Don't put them anywhere else because they don't want interference. Like my Jeep, if you look down here, I've got a bunch of wires that go up into my dash because those are for my winches and starter, all kinds of stuff. You don't want interference. You want to run these wires with their own loom that does not loom with any other wire and they need to go right on top of your battery terminals. So like my battery terminals, I got this nut and bolt right here. I'm going to pop this off, put my ground on this one, and then I will put my positive of the Holly harness onto this one. And Holly told me it's crazy, you know, what guys have done where they hooked up power to I said if something happens, they get corroded, and, you know, maybe something starts back feeding into this harness, is that a good idea? And Rep told me, he's like, yeah, you can wire up those fans, but he highly recommended leaving my fans on the separate system on a Jeep because with all the corrosion that we face and these really aren't sealed vehicles at all it's just not worth the risk so I'm personally not using any of this wire. Hey you know I've got an off-road Jeep and these wires get corroded once in a while and especially if I'm going in water and mud etc. I said if something happens they get corroded and, you know maybe something starts back feeding into this harness is that a good idea and Rep told me He's like, yeah, you can wire up those fans, but he highly recommended leaving my fans on the separate system on a Jeep because with all the corrosion that we face, and these really aren't sealed vehicles at all, 
it's just not worth the risk. So I'm personally not using any of this wire. Now you might be wondering why I'm not going with computer controlled ignition right now. Well, it's simple, but it's also complicated. The way that a modern car works for ignition systems is they've got, rather than one single coil, they've got individual coils over each cylinder, right? And the engine knows when to fire those because there's a crank angle sensor that tells the computer where the engine is at, and then it can figure out timing from there. Well, obviously our Jeeps don't have this technology in them. All I've got is a distributor and a coil. Now, Holley has for the V8 special distributors that work with their Holley Sniper setup, but unfortunately nothing like this exists for the almighty flathead engine that we've got. So I did a little bit of researching. I'm not 100% knowledgeable, but I know just enough to be dangerous, so I'll explain quickly in this video why I'm not going with it. Now my Jeep has an electronic distributor. As the rotor turns, as the engine's running, there's a magnet, and that magnet reads on the sensor right here. It's called a Hall's Effect sensor. And then this sensor relays the information to the control module, and then the module tells the spark plug when to spark. Super simple. If you look at computer-controlled distributors, they don't have this module inside of them. They have the Hall's Effect sensor's wiring coming directly out, and then they plug those two wires into the computer system, and then there's a special ignition, you know, you need a high-powered ignition coil, you need an ignition coil control box. I called up a guy that makes fuel injection kits for wheelies, and this is long before the sniper ever existed, and I asked him, I said, hey, why can't we use this style distributor with the Hall's Effect sensor, wire that straight to the ignition, call it a day. He said, well, the problem is because the computer cannot control every aspect of the timing, you still have to rely on where you place a distributor and then the computer can obviously vary this within you know 10 to 15 percent timing you know, as you rev up more the computer might add a little bit of timing through the control module he said it gains you a little bit of performance but it is definitely a lot of work now if you look inside of a distributor right here there are weights and springs so as the jeep turns faster these weights move out and it changes the position of the rotor, slows down, the weights come back in, changes the position of the rotors. Naturally, Jeep adjusts its timing when you rev. If you want to go ahead with computer controlled timing, you can remove the weights from your distributor, get rid of the module, and use this Hall's Effect sensor and figure out a way to hook it up. Or you can just send one of these out to the fuel injection company and they can do it for you. current thoughts here with knowing enough information to be dangerous and I don't want to lead anyone uh, with incorrect information but my belief at this time before even running the setup we're gonna have a perfect air fuel mixture depending on what the O2 sensor tells the carburetor so as long as our timing is perfect right here the computer is gonna adjust the fuel mixture to match this and we're only talking a 60 horsepower engine if we're going for a thousand horsepower V8 you absolutely want to make sure that timing is perfect to get every horsepower out of the engine. The flathead, you know what, I'm just going to let it rip and see what happens. With the non-computer controlled timing system, it doesn't matter if you have a distributor like this, or points, vacuum advance, mechanical advance, it doesn't matter, just put the one wire on the coil and you're done. If you have a vacuum advance distributor, Holly actually gives you a fitting the hooks the vacuum from your distributor into the sniper. So you just thread this in, put your vacuum line on, and you're done. Let's talk about the fuel system for a second on the sniper. We have a dash 6AN inlet that must be high pressure and a dash 6AN outlet, which is low pressure. A 6AN is kind of in between the 5 16ths and 3 8 fuel line. If you look up the equivalent of a 6AN fuel line, you'll see a lot of reports that they say it's about a 5 16ths. I've got a 5 16 barb right here, and it slides right through, not very tight at all. But I've got a 3 8 barb right here, and that seems much more comparable. It's actually going to create a seal, so if you're going to do fittings that adapt to a brass barb, I'd go with the 3 8 for sure, and then I'd use a quarter inch NPT rather than the eighth inch. Now you can go the cheap route and get a 6 an to barb fitting adapter, and you can just thread that on there and then you can go to AutoZone and get just standard high pressure fuel line 
that's EPA rated and you can push right into here, put a little clamp on it, run it to your fuel tank, all good to go. For not much more money, I would actually go out and purchase a 6AN fuel line kit. And these are really nice high pressure EPA style hoses that are going to work great for the fuel system. Now I've got a modified fuel tank on my Jeep, but if you look at a stock one, this would be the inlet to the sniper and this would be the fuel return line. So you can put in a fitting that goes to the 6AN line right here. And then for the return line, it's kind of like a brake flare in here. You can probably just buy a brake line bend it to a 90 degree and then push the hose over the flared end and it should seal up pretty good. Why would this be the inlet and this be the return line? Well, it's pretty simple. The return line on a fuel system is designed to not aerate the gas tanks. So let's say you've got your fuel tank and you decide, you know what, I'm just gonna drill and tap a fitting on the top and put the return right up here. Well, in theory it would work, but the problem is as the fuel comes into the fuel tank, it's dropping all this distance and it's aerating the fuel system, creating bubbles, etc. And when you're sloshing around in the Jeep, those air bubbles can find their way into the inlet and just mess up the fuel injection system. It's gonna be a little hard to show this on the camera, but if you look to the left, that is the fuel return line inside the stock Jeep gas tank. And you see it's got a downspout that kind of goes up in the air and then it brings it down to almost the exact bottom of the fuel tank. Again, that's to prevent aeration. Now, I don't like how close it is to the fuel pickup because you obviously don't want those two conflicting with each other and putting air into the system. However, there are quite a few people that are running a different style fuel injection system made for the Willys a few years ago, and they've been using this setup without issue, so I'd say go for it. If you have a modified fuel tank like mine is you know, all custom made, I actually have a downspout in mind, so what I did is took a brass fitting, some copper tubing, soldered them together, and I made myself a downspout. So what that does is this fitting right here is my fuel return line, but the tube that connects to this fitting goes almost all the way down to the tank. So when the fuel returns into the tank, it's going back into fuel rather than dropping and creating aeration. This is how my particular external fuel pump system is going to look because my fuel tank sitting in the back of the Jeep and I wanted everything to be underneath it. The fuel pump has to be located within about two feet of the outlet of the fuel tank. That's because these pumps are way more efficient pushing fuel than sucking the fuel. So you want to push as much fuel as possible and suck as least as possible. And what you have to do before the pump, you need a pre-filter. This is between 20 to 40 microns. Now after you have your pre-filter, goes into the fuel pump, and then after the fuel pump, you need a 10 micron filter. These things are actually pretty big, but they're really nice, really heavy duty, and these are actually designed where you can open them up, clean out the filter, and put it back together. Now because these are a high pressure fuel system, you can run normal fuel line and then just use a clamp around it that's meant for high pressure, but just going the extra step with AN line, such as this, you can get steel braided. This is actually a nylon braided because the nylon, it doesn't cut your fingers open when you're grabbing it, which I really enjoy. And it's super strong, really clean looking too, kind of an OEM look. And I think this really fits the Jeep well. I bought a variety pack with my fuel line that came with a bunch of miscellaneous fittings. It'd been nice to have an extra 90 degree, but I made everything work right here. And I was a little intimidated at first making these AN fittings because you have to connect them together a certain way, but Honestly, once you get the hang of it, you can make one of these fittings in about a minute. In a whole line, you know, just a couple minutes, not much time at all. High pressure, really nice looking, especially for a show Jeep. And it's just nice knowing that uh, your lines are kind of set up like a hydraulic line and way less prone to fail compared to just a standard line with a clamp on it. The pros of the external fuel system is that you can mount everything below your Jeep. You don't have to do any welding and it's easy to get everything. The cons are that the fuel pump runs a lot hotter being outside the fuel tank and it takes up a lot more room. You got a little bit more fittings down there. You know, the fuel pump is working pretty hard and when it's inside the fuel tank, it gets cooled by all the fuel sitting there. When it's outside the fuel tank, they definitely get a lot hotter and they don't last quite as long, but it's not hard to keep one of these in your spare parts out on the trail. Although, no matter if you have an in-tank or out-of-tank setup, you're still going to need the post filter outside the fuel tank. 
Alrighty, we've got the sniper 100% hooked up. I can't believe we're about ready to start this thing. Better go over the wiring a little bit with you and the fuel plumbing. So Holly recommends that you have a fuel pressure gauge right off the sniper system just to verify that you're getting enough fuel pressure for the system. I believe we need about 60 PSI for that. But I figure we'll leave this on all the time because it's a good diagnostic tool. So I've got a union fitting, a 6AN female to female, and then I've got a fitting for the gauge, then a 90 degree angle down. For the return line, I've got a 180 degree fitting, fuel line comes out, and then they both meet together with one of these uh, little fittings right here that keep them separated, but nice and clean looking together. And then it goes all the way down. Now, my fuel system is a little bit different from standard because my Jeep was kind of built for rock crawling. So you'll notice if you go underneath my Jeep, my exhaust actually doesn't hang down very far at all, maybe an inch. My entire exhaust system, I actually cut the header and raise it up a little bit, and then my muffler's underneath here. So because of that, my fuel system does not run on the driver's side. So my fuel lines are going all the way around the engine bay, under the passenger seat where my fuel tank's going to be. I've got a hole in the firewall that I run all my wires through, and then I bunch them up all right about here behind the body. You need to be careful when you do this because the clutch pedal actually comes into this area. So what you can do is get a little zip tie holder and maybe rivet it to the inside of the fender past the body here and zip tie all those away from the clutch pedal so that way when it comes forward it doesn't hit your wiring. And then the Holly setup does come with its own relay and fuse. I used existing holes that were in my tub. So I got my fuse mounted up here, my relay mounted right here. Easy to get to, it's away from the rest of the harness. I wired the Holly system exactly how they had the preset wiring. So the power wire for the fuel pump was separated from the power wire and the ground wire of the rest of the harness. So I actually loomed that separately from the rest of the wires. It does not touch them because I don't want electrical interference with that. This is the type of wiring loom that I used. I really like it because it's nice and modern. And this is exactly it right here. It looks really good inside the Jeep. The factory Jeeps use like an asphalt coated loom, which you can see right about here. The problem with the asphalt coated loom is that it's solid. So you have to run all the wires 100% through it and then add the terminals once they're out the other side. There's no split in the middle. This is a problem with the Holly setup because there's connectors already set up to it. So it doesn't work out that well. So the split loom is really, really good and it looks nice and modern and it kind of looks old school. Perfect. I did end up running my coolant sensor into the dash right there. And then I made a pigtail that runs behind the dash that connects to the original Holly loom back here and then runs down into the sniper system. Would I do that again? I don't know. The wire actually will reach from the Holly to the coolant sensor if you just run up underneath right here on this lip. Really there's not much more else to it. It looks really clean, really modern. Yeah, we got a lot of wiring going on in here and it's not as clean as factory, but you gotta remember we have a lot more functions in factory. So I prefer function over super clean wiring. Although I have junction boxes for my power wires, I ran the Holly straight to the battery terminal as the manual said. So here's the power wire and here's the ground wire. I can't believe it, but we're down to the final moments here. I'm ready to power up the Jeep and follow the instructions for setting up the digital dash right here. This has all of our parameters for running the Jeep. And you'll notice on the side of this dash, there is a mini SD card, and this is what holds your files, your data logging, etc. So be sure to not lose that. Now because we're Jeeps and we don't exactly have a sealed exterior, this thing doesn't look super waterproof, so I would use it for diagnostics, setting up the Jeep, and then if you have an ammo can, maybe as your center console, put it inside that. I don't think I would mount this to the dash because it just doesn't look super sealed. I'm about ready to turn the Jeep key switch for the first time. Hopefully all goes well. And do we have Holly? Yes, we do. Alrighty. Look at that, that is, this is awesome. I've worked so hard to get to this point. So select a wizard from the main menu, which we're gonna do with a stylus. 
I just saw a 4 right here thinking, oh, a 4 cylinder, but that's not the case. If you can actually scroll down, and there's tons of sniper options. In our Autolite 1100, there's a part number 550-552, and that is the correct one. Now we pick a 4 cylinder. Engine displacement's 134. Target idle speed is 600. Stock camshaft. Sniper ignition coil negative. And let it load that file. No leaks and we are at 60 PSI which is perfect. Day three, I think we finally got her figured out. Gonna do the first start with the sniper. Again. Well, looky there. Ah. Got good fuel pressure. And it's idling, no more misfire. That was a little noisy. So what we need to do now is wait for this to get up to at least 160 degrees, uh, which is when my thermostat opens, and that's the minimal operating temperature to set the idle on the sniper. Alrighty, we're going to do a cold start on the sniper. This is going to be the first start after I drove it around for about 20 to 30 minutes. Not bad. Could probably use a little bit of fuel tuning right at startup. But the engine starts idling high and then it slowly brings itself back down. Once it warms up, that'll keep going down. But this thing has never ran so smooth at this RPM. Our AFRs are looking pretty good at idle. Super stoked on it. Just got done playing with the Jeep for the first time, and man, is it so much fun playing with that little sniper setup. Uh, just even with, I've got maybe 20 to 30 minutes on the tune right now, just bopping around the backyard, and it's already running exceptionally well. Just want to leave you guys with some things that I learned throughout the whole process and some things that I would change and things that you might want to prepare for. First up, I would like to note that I am completely new to this setup. I don't know all the ins and outs of tuning it. I know that it's actually pretty easy to go through these menus like you go to tuning. You can actually adjust the fuel pressure and how many pounds per hour it's going to flow out the injector. There's just so much information that I have yet to explore and it's going to take me some time to figure this out to get the Jeep 100% perfect. Like I know you can go in here and adjust how much fuel pressure you add when you initially start the vehicle. That way it starts better. You can change pretty much everything. Something to play around with. I'm not an expert in tuning it. This is my first time playing with it so I don't want to preach what I don't know. But uh, as far as this video, it's all about the installation and getting the Jeep going. I'd say we did a pretty good job at that. Sniper system is definitely going to need a 12 volt alternator. I bought a special kit for a Jeep that would put out some pretty good amperage at low RPM. But I ended up having to change that alternator when I was out in Nevada. And I just bought whatever was on the shelf that I knew would kind of bolt on the Jeep. What I have found is with the electric fans and the sniper and the fuel pump and you got headlights and all kinds of stuff. 
I actually don't have enough alternator for what I'm running right now. I'm not quite sure what the amperage is at this RPM, but I'd say you want a high amperage alternator for sure. I would like to mess with the air horn a little bit more from the factory. They've got this thing slotted maybe half an inch up, and the problem is that the slots sit up higher than the base of the sniper. You know, this thing's just a little bit too tall. So you can, uh, you know, either tack weld these shut, or you can maybe grind off the bottom, you know, half of it just to get it to sit down better, and then put, you know, a piece of rubber around the clamp so that way it's a hundred percent sealed and you're not getting uh, airflow in through here. And I'd probably put a hose around here to keep airflow from going in there as well. As I mentioned before, with the original carb diffuser gasket, this base is extremely thick to help with heat dissipation. And when I cut this out, I just left the original gasket and put it on my Jeep. And that's because we want as least amount of heat in the sniper as possible. The problem with the sniper is that the computer is built into it. So the computer is sitting above the exhaust manifold. Wouldn't be a bad idea to put some heat shielding over the exhaust manifold. I know if you look at a generator or welder engine that used the Willys Jeep setup, they've got a, a bracket that actually mounts to the bottom of the carburetor that shields the exhaust manifold off of it, so that's probably worth looking into as well. Bit of advice before you take on this project is make sure your Jeep is in good running condition before you do the sniper setup. The sniper will not accommodate for bad distributor timing, bad spark plugs or wires or points. If you have an intake or an exhaust leak, that's going to throw off your O2 reading at the bottom. Because if you're running exhaust out of here, then it's not reading the correct amount going out the muffler. One thing to look out for on the stock manifolds is there's that heat riser built in that's a flapper that's designed to heat up the carburetor when the engine is cold. And that flapper has a rod that goes all the way through the exhaust manifold and sometimes those things actually leak exhaust. If you put your hand around the sides when the engine's running, you can get, might get some puffs of air in your hand. When I was installing my exhaust manifold a few months back, I actually welded that flapper in the open position. That way the carburetor did not get heated up. So what I did was cut the rod that comes out of the sides of the manifold. And I used high temperature JB weld to seal it off all the way around. And that got rid of my exhaust leak. You can also, if your manifolds are off, maybe just drill and tap the manifolds and just put a bolt in there. There's a few different solutions, but if your Jeep isn't leaking around there at all, then you can just leave it. Of course, as anything can fail, a carburetor can fail, a coil can fail, a sniper could also fail. If you're planning to go to a remote area like the Rubicon Trail or Moab or any place like that, it would not be a bad idea to get yourself a spare sniper setup. Leave it with you in your toolbox, get an extra fuel pump, anything that you might need for the fuel injection system. I probably carry a spare. Overall, I'm super excited on the sniper setup. I've been dreaming about fuel injection on my Jeep since I was 17. First thing I ever wanted to do to it, and I'm glad I finally have it in my possession.